I go back to Zoom. Mm -hmm. Okay, wait, wait for it to be done. Okay, go back to Zoom. Wait, wait for it to be done. Okay, it's done. Okay, now go back to Zoom. And chat, on the chat, right? You're live. You're, you are live? Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Okay, now what? Do I have the okay from admin to proceed? Do I have the okay from admin to proceed? Okay, so inshallah for today we'll switch to Facebook Live and we'll resolve this uh, problem for next week. Inshallah I'm going to go to Facebook Live. Jazakallah khair. Okay. It's a, uh, it's an, it's, it's, okay, alhamdulillah. Okay, it's working. Okay, we're back on Facebook Live. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Wa aftaru salati wa tamma taslim ala Sayyidina Rasulullah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam ajma'in. I apologize for that 10-minute delay. We were having some difficulties getting Zoom connected to Facebook, but alhamdulillah, we are back on now. Uh, so, inshallah, we'll begin. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Wa aftaru salati wa atamu taslim ala Sayyidina Rasulullah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam ajma'in. Okay, that's the second or third time we tried uh, starting. Hopefully there'll be no more technical issues. If you are still here, then jazakallah khair for your patience. Um, okay, so we are in Surah Al-An'am, chapter 6, verse number 91. Ba'da a'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. وَمَا قَدَرُ اللَّهَ حَقَّ قَدْرِهِ إِذْ قَالُوا مَا أَنزَلَ اللَّهُ عَلَى بَشَرٍ مِّنْ شَيْءٍ قُلْ مَنْ أَنزَلَ الْكِتَابَ الَّذِي جَاءَ بِهِ مُوسَى نُورًا وَهُدًى لِلنَّاسِ تَجْعَلُونَهُ قَرَاطِيسَ تُبْدُونَهَا وَتُخْفُونَ كَثِيرًا وَعَلِّمْتُمْ مَا لَمْ تَعْلَمُوا أَنْتُمْ وَلَا آبَاؤُكُمْ قُلِ اللَّهُ ثُمَّ ذَرْهُمْ فِي خَوْضِهِمْ يَلْعَبُونَ Okay so here verse 91 um means they did not form any proper estimate of Allah. Now, I don't like that translation, to be very honest, uh, because what, it's the, what, what the verse is saying is, They have not appreciated Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as it is his right to be appreciated. That means they have not recognized him as it is his right to be uh, recognized. And what statement of theirs conveys this lack of appreciation, this lack of recognition, when they said that Allah has not revealed anything to man, right? Allah has not revealed anything. This is what the people said, right? Ask them the book which Musa brought as a light and guidance for people and which you keep in bits and scraps, some of which you disclose while the rest you conceal, even though through it you were taught that which neither you nor your forefathers knew. Who was it that revealed it? Say Allah and then leave them to sport with their argumentation. So basically what is going on in this verse? Um, what's going on in this verse is that the mushrikeen of Mecca who had no book, were illiterate, looked up to the Jewish community because they were people of the book. They had scripture, they were literate, they had knowledge from their book. So when the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam claimed his prophethood, and uh, you know, spoke of revelation. At that time, it is the um, Mushrikeen of Mecca that actually went to the Jewish community and asked them about revelation. Is there such a thing? And out of their anger and spite and you know, uh, uh, you know, extreme rage against the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they denied this phenomena of revelation altogether, although they themselves were recipients of scripture, just like out of anger, just out of, you know, uh, extreme grudge and jealousy, as we know, unfortunately characterized um, uh, that community. Out of that, they just, you know, gave them an, a, an, a factually incorrect answer, right? But that answer empowered the mushrikeen of Quraysh even more oh Allah has not sent on anything people that are more knowledgeable than us are telling us that so then this definitely what Muhammad is saying is just what we thought a fabrication a you know something that is not coming from the heavens at all okay so this is why you have this confrontation um where the question is being posed say who is it then 
who sent down the kitab that was given to Musa that was a light and a guidance for the people, right? If Allah is not the one that has revealed anything to any human being, then what um, you who claim this, who are uh, the ones that gave the information out that nothing has been revealed uh, upon any human being, then uh, who, who revealed the uh, Torah to Musa that you yourselves recite? So, you know, there's a blatant, uh, you know, a lie being told here. And so the confrontation of that lie is going on. Now, in terms of qadr, the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the appreciation, the value that we ought to give to uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, um, these are the, the best days of the year to do that, to try to revive our appreciation for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, sometimes we take the most uh, important things in our lives for granted, right? Um, have we ever thought about the air that we breathe? Have we ever thought about, you know, the parents that sustain us and take care of us without whom we will be just, you know, lost and hungry and uh, cold probably? Uh, do we think about the Lord that sustains us in our, uh, you know, life uh, on, in this world, gives us that air to breathe without which, you know, we would literally be gasping for life, right? So we have not appreciated Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as it is his right to be appreciated. We have not worshipped him as it is his right to be worshipped and praised and remembered. You know, um, because human beings have a very difficult time fulfilling the rights um, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, you know, these days of the hijjah are a great opportunity to recommit ourselves to the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to try to recognize um, him and appreciate him as is his full right to be recognized and uh, appreciated. Um, now, the other problem with, you know, completely denying that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had sent a book, what that actually is doing, um, first of all, it is a blatant ungrateful lie, right, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not sent anything on any human being, right, because like the verse said that who sent the book that Musa alayhi salam has, right, um, that, that Musa alayhi salam received. Also, claiming that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not sent on anything is really attacking the perfection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, really. Because what does it imply? Number one, it implies <clears throat> either he doesn't have the power to send down revelation. So if that is the implication, then how is that recognizing Allah's power and authority? How is that recognizing his perfection according to his perfect names and attributes? So it's actually saying he hasn't revealed on anything is actually attacking the perfection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So one is either he doesn't have the authority to send it down or um, it implies also that God just sent man down to live on earth randomly without any purpose. And we don't know why we're here. And Allah created us and it just kind of left us. And we don't know what we're here for and what the purpose is and what we're supposed to do, right? Which is exactly what would be the case if uh, there was no revelation, right? So it implies randomness in the creation of the human being and a randomness of our descent onto uh, earth, that then there is no arrangement for the guidance of this creature that was created, right? Um, and yesterday we already talked at length about the role of the Quran in guiding us to our ultimate uh, destination of paradise, right? So we know from the Quran and from the role that the Quran plays in guiding us back to Allah subhanahu and guiding us back to Jannah, that claiming that Allah subhanahu has not sent anything is really saying that he doesn't, he hasn't made any arrangement for our guidance and he just created us and left us uh, randomly, right? And what does that go against? So the first, that, that he doesn't have the power to send down revelation goes against Allah's full power and authority. And the second, that God created us and then left us randomly without purpose, that implies, that implication goes against Allah's wisdom. And that wisdom is a necessary part of his perfection. So this claim detracts from the perfection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is why the verse begins with saying that they have not appreciated Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as he ought to be. They have not recognized Allah as they ought to have recognized and appreciated him because had they done that as is his right, then they would not have dared to make such a horrible, baseless claim, a blatant lie that he has not revealed anything. So understand, there's a clear connection between recognizing and appreciating Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and affirming prophethood. It is of the perfection of Allah's power and wisdom that he sends prophets. He's fully capable of sending prophets. He has the full power to do that. And he in his full wisdom has 
fully arranged for our complete uh, you know, um, the, the necessities needed, all, everything that we needed to, uh, you know, receive guidance, uh, to be guided, right, and to know the straight path from the wrong path. All of that has been taken care of. This is part of the Islamic worldview. Prophethood, uh, affirming prophethood, goes back to recognizing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the powerful and wise being that he is and appreciating him in that way, right? So this is part of the Islamic worldview. Prophethood is part of the Islamic worldview and it is part of affirming Allah's perfection right um, and there's no other way to be guided except the revelation right even our prophet Muhammad وسلم, who yes was there contemplating alone in Ghara Hira right he knew what his people were doing uh, was wrong but he didn't know how to pray he didn't know how to fast he didn't know how to um, you know complete the hajj and uh, do all those acts that then form uh, proper deen that guides us to the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so there's no way to know how to worship Allah and please him and try to earn his paradise except if he tells us and he has told us through uh, revelation okay so this is a huge unworthy lie okay let's look at verse number 92 Okay, verse number 92. وَهَذَا كِتَابٌ أَنزَلْنَاهُ مُبَارَكٌ مُصَدِّقُ الَّذِي بَيْنَ يَدَيْهِ وَلِتُنْذِرَ أُمُّ الْقُرَى وَمَنْ حَوْلَهَا وَالَّذِينَ يُؤْمِنُونَ بِالْآخِرَةِ يُؤْمِنُونَ بِهِ وَهُمْ عَلَى صَلَاتِهِمْ يُحَافِظُونَ Verse number 92. Like that book, this too is a book which we have revealed, the one full of blessing, confirming what was revealed before it so that you might warn the people of the mother of cities, Yani Mecca, and those around it, those who believe in the hereafter, believe in it and are ever mindful of their prayers. Okay, so this is the book that we have revealed and it confirms that which was revealed before it. So here is a, uh, you know, this verse is actually completely denying and negating uh, this claim that Allah has not sent him anything, right? Allah affirms again here in verse 72 that he is the one who has revealed this blessed book in our hands and he is the one that revealed uh, the books before it, right? Um, and why is it blessed? Why is it described as blessed? We already know why, right? It's blessed. But the abundance of khair that it brings into our lives and the abundance of khair that it guides us to for our tomorrow, for our akhirah in our eternity, right? The, uh, no matter how much khair one is given in dunya, compares nothing to, uh, you know, the blessings of the akhirah, obviously, right? So it, the Quran guides us to a life of khair and goodness. And if we follow its lead, there is so much more of khair and goodness, blessings and bliss that await us in, uh, in Jannah, right? Which it wants to uh, guide us to, right? Um, and it also serves to warn, right? It is Mubarak, and it also serves to warn Umm al-Qura, yani Mecca is also called Umm al-Qura. It's to warn its people. Remember this verse, a surah is, al uh, is is um, addressed to the mushrikeen of uh, Mecca, right? And it's addressed to Muslim and addressed to all of humanity uh, for all times, right? So here specifically, however, Mecca is uh, mentioned, and it also mentions to warn the cities that are around Mecca, right? To, uh, warn the other regions as well. And then there is an identification of the class of believers that is going to benefit from the book, right? It's really very beautiful. Um, those that believe in the akhirah, in the next life, they in fact believe in the book and they are protective of their salah, of their prayers. So there are two characteristics. Um, you know, here outlined over here, the, the ones that will believe in it or those that actually do believe in this book are those that believe in the Akhirah. You have to believe in an afterlife for deen to make sense. If there's no concept of an afterlife, you know, following, you know, an organized religion doesn't make any, uh, um, doesn't make much sense, right? So the ones that are going to benefit from the book, the ones who believe in the book are actually the ones who believe in a ghaib as well. And they are protective of their uh, prayers, right? So the prayer, the salah, which is mentioned right after the ghaib is mentioned is actually an 
affirmation of one's iman in the ghaib. Why would you pray if there's no akhir, right? If there's no day you have to stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then why would you pray, right? And interestingly, the verse doesn't just say, and they pray, they believe in the ghaib and they pray. It says they protect their prayers. They guard their prayers. They guard the conditions of the prayers, the requirements of the prayers, you know, the adab, the etiquettes of the prayer. They really actively try to perfect the performance and the manner of the uh, of the salah, right? So, uh, you know, the greatest um, protector of the uh, prayers of, of our salah, the greatest protector of our salah are the sunnahs, right? The fard, of course, uh, you have to pray. But the protector of the prayer are the sunnahs because this is the first thing that we're going to be asked about on the day of judgment, right? There's a hadith in uh, Tirmidhi, it's a Hassan hadith, and the Sunnah of Ramat Tirmidhi, rahimahullah ta'ala, and the Adali Abu Huraira, radiyallahu an, that the Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, the first of man's deeds for which he will be called to account on the day of resurrection will be salah. If it is found to be perfect, he will be safe and successful. But if it is Incomplete, he will be unfortunate and a loser. Now, listen to the next part. If any shortcoming is found in the Fard Salah, the glorious and exalted Rabb will command to see whether his slave has offered any voluntary Salah so that the Fard Salah may be made up by it. Then the rest of his actions will be treated in the same manner. SubhanAllah. So, if there was something wrong with your Fard, there was something missing in your fard, let's say you forgot to pray one day or you were supposed to pray and you didn't uh, pray for whatever uh, reason, right? Um, or you missed uh, the prayer uh, deliberately or if you um, were not fully concentrating and uh, you know, paying attention in your prayer. Now, how many of us have a perfect prayer where uh, we are fully attentive and focusing on the meanings of the words of the prayer from the beginning of it till the end of it? I don't know if uh, you know any of us are capable uh, or actually do that, right? SubhanAllah. So then what is it that is going to make up for those deficiencies? Because you know only that part of the prayer is accepted that you were attentive in, by the way, right? This is another scary thought that only that much of the prayer is accepted, that which we were aware uh, of what we were saying, we were conscious, right? This is why the Prophet says to the man who prays improperly that go back and pray again for you have not prayed, right? Although he prayed in front of the Prophet, so Allah, somebody wasn't doing it properly. So he said, go and do it again because you haven't prayed. Yani, this doesn't count as uh, the prayer. So if we're not praying properly and it's not counting, then what is going to make up for that fard? It is the sunnahs, right? And that's why we have the sunnah system, right? Two before, two after, before Fajr, before Zuhur, after Zuhur, you know, all of these different sunnahs that we have. And some are, you know, more recommended, of course, than others. But the system of the sunnah is there to protect us, to protect our prayer, to protect us at that moment, this moment that this hadith describes. And we're going to have to stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and God forbid the salah is falling short, right? And again, we all have fallen short when it comes to our prayer, right? Uh, you're supposed to start praying the day you turn what, and when you're seven, you're supposed to start. Is How many have, have prayed perfectly since we were seven years old every single time? So the sunnahs in this sense, you know, are, are something that we cannot um, ignore. We cannot be lazy when it comes to the offering of the sunnahs. And this is confused with, oh, it's just sunnah, I don't have to do it. That's not what is meant by something being sunnah and not fard, that is a different category, right? We should not belittle these sunnahs of the salah that are there to protect the fard so that we can make it successfully, um, you know, on the day of judgment, inshallah. So, you know, really, really, let's keep that in mind uh, next time we pray, inshallah. Okay, um, verse number 93. وَمَنْ أَظْلَمُ مِمَّنْ افْتَرُوا عَلَى اللَّهِ كَذِبًا أَوْ قَالَ أُوحِيَ إِلَيَّ وَلَمْ يُوحَى إِلَيْهِ شَيْءٍ ومن قال سأنزل مثل ما أنزل الله ولو ترى إذ الظالمون في غمرات الموت والملائكة باسطوا أيديهم 
أخرجوا أنفسكم اليوم ترزون عذاب الهون بما كنتم تقولون على الله غير الحق وكنتم عن آياته تستكبرون okay. So here is verse number 93 who can be more unjust than he who foists a lie on Allah or says revelation has come to me when in fact nothing was revealed to him and who says I will produce the like of what Allah has revealed. If you could but see the wrongdoers in the agonies of death and the angels stretching out their hands saying yield up your souls. Today you will be recompensed with the punishment of humiliation for the lie that you spoke concerning Allah and for you waxing proud against his signs. Okay, this is a really scary verse about the consequences of lying against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, lying is always wrong, but when you start making up lies about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, obviously that is even worse, right? And the most dreadful time will be the moment of death for such people who had wronged uh, their own souls when they lied against uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The kind of greeting that they're going to get at the moment that the angels come to seize their souls. We have this in Surah Al-Anfal as well. Verse number 50. وَلَوْ تَرَى إِذْ يَتَوَفَّ الَّذِينَ كَثَرُوا الْمَلَائِكَةُ يَوْرِبُونَ وُجُوهَهُمْ وَأَدَبَارَهُمْ وَذُوقُوا عَذَابَ الْحَرِيقُ And were you to see when the angels are giving death to the disbelievers and they're beating their faces and their backs and they are saying, you know, taste the punishment of burning, right? Of the burning, subhanAllah. So this is how the process begins for, uh, uh, you know, the people that are uh, going to be punished for those who disbelieved. And, you know, um, the way that they're greeted is um, by darb, by actually receiving the punishment of being beaten on their faces and their backs and Two angels, black and blue-eyed, come to him. One of them is called Al-Munkar and the other An-Nakir. They say, what did you used to say about this man? So he says what he was saying before, that he is Allah's slave and his messenger. Yeah, and this is when they're asked about our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So this is one of the questions of the grave, right? That what do you say about this man? What do you say about um, Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? So the person who was righteous, who was a believer, who was upon the sunnah, so really important to prayer sunnahs, right? Um, will know and recognize the messenger of Allah, uh, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he will say, he is Allah's slave and his messenger. I testify that none has the right to be worshipped but Allah and that Muhammad is his slave and his messenger. That's it. That's the answer, you know. Uh, all of us know it in this world, but we will only be able to say it in our graves if we had lived our lives according to Allah and his messenger, right? So they will say, we knew that you would say this. Then his grave is expanded to 70 by 70 cubits. Then it is illuminated for him. Then it is set him sleep. So he said, can I return to my family to inform them? They say sleep as a newlywed whom none awakens but the dearest of his family until Allah resurrects him from his resting place. If, but if he was a hypocrite, now the narration continues, he would say, so now is the answer coming from the other type of soul, the evil soul, the hypocrite, the one who's going to, going to be punished. When he is asked about the Prophet وسلم, in the grave, what does he say? This is his response. I heard people saying something, so I said the same. I, I don't know. So they said, we knew you would say that. So the earth is told, constrict him. Basically squeeze him, right? So it constricts him squeezing his ribs together. He continues being punished like that until Allah resurrects him, subhanAllah. So this is the punishment in uh, the grave for you know, such an individual. Uh, may Allah subhanahu wa protect us from you know, such a horrible end. And you know, this also shows us the 
importance of uh, following the Sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Only those that felt close to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in this world uh, and lived according to his Sunnah, you know, fulfilled, um, you know, the duty that we owe to of obedience that we owe to our Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. You know, um, following the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is fault, right? We all know following the Sunnah of our Rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam is fault. How do we fulfill that fard, that obligation? It's not a choice to follow the Rasul or not to follow him, right? It's an obligation. Now, if any time we tell someone to uh, pray sunnahs or do something at sunnah, if every time they just say it's just sunnah, then how are you ever going to fulfill the obligation of following the Prophet, sallallahu Because following him is not sunnah, right? The way you're going to follow him is fard then what do you follow him in if you never follow him at all, right? That is the question. So we should not um, be lazy and try to just uh, give ourselves false uh, consolation that I don't have to do this because you know it's not sunnah. Yes, there's a difference in the fard and the sunnahs, but we can't adopt that as a lifestyle so that sunnah does not uh, end up forming any part of our daily lives. This is how we're going to, inshallah, recognize the Rasul Sallallahu in our grave if we were close to a sunnah in our lifetime, inshallah. Now, the two reasons that are mentioned here uh, because of which the people will be punished in this way. Um, number one, the fact that they used to lie against Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala, right? They didn't limit themselves just to rejecting the message, but they went further and made up lies against Rabbul Alameen, against Lord of the worlds, okay? Whether it was saying things like Allah hasn't revealed anything, whether it was attributing a statement to Allah that he had not said, or a piece of legislation like Haram Haral to Allah that he had not designated, whatever the case it is, all of these come under lying against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, why is this so serious? Obviously, it's serious to lie. Obviously, even more serious to lie against Allah. But what it practically does, why it's really such a great wulm, a great source of oppression, is because it corrupts the deen. If people begin to believe these lies, you are saying that Allah said this and he didn't, and people who don't know any better, who look up to you, uh, start believing this, then you have corrupted the deen for these people. Then you have changed the guidance that Allah revealed. Then you are giving them your version of what you think they should do and how they should live. And this is now what Allah has told them to do. Therefore, it is no longer the deen of Allah that people will be upon, and therefore they would lose out the benefits that can only be found in following the deen of Allah khalis and right, purely the deen of Allah subhanahu wa because no one else has the wisdom and the insight, and not insight, we can't say that for Allah, the wisdom and the authority and the power and the knowledge um, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has, no one else has that. So anytime anyone changes something that Allah has revealed, uh, then we are changing um, the words of Allah, the deen of Allah, and taking more benefit from the people. And this is why disobedience will never make sense. This is the reason. Anytime we disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you know, not follow something he's telling us to do, what am I really saying when I do that? I'm really saying I know better than Allah. Astaghfirullah. No one would ever say that, right? Even like the worst sinners not going to say, I know better than Allah. But that's practically what we are saying and doing when we do the opposite of what Allah has commanded, right? Since I'm doing it, why are you doing it? There has to be a reason. Like, do you know better? Could it be better for you ever, uh, right? So this is what we have to uh, think about. So, you know, um, changing the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's like changing the chemical formula of the medicine um, or mixing some poison in the medicine and then giving it to the patient, right? People are supposed to receive Allah's deed in its pure form, no bid'ah, no additions, no deletions, no subtractions, right? Not a, you know, contrived, messed up uh, version, right? That would be akin to giving someone medicine, but putting a little bit of poison in it as well, right? What kind of effect is that medicine then going to have? And in this case, it was so serious because then they attributed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And, um, you know, we also know about lying against the Prophet, and how serious it is for those that used to make up uh, lies against the Prophet. Actually, there's been so many fabricated uh, hadith, it's mind boggling. And guess what? What's even worse is, um, what's even more tragic is that they, the people who did it, 
did it with good intentions. Right? They claim to have done, they would later admit it that yes, I made up this lie about how much reward you get for reading such and such surah of the Quran because I saw the people in my town neglecting the Quran. So I thought if I made up a hadith, said that the Prophet said it, um, that there's so much virtue in reciting such and such surah, uh, then people it would help the people come back to the Quran. Now, they had good intentions, but remember, for a deed to be rewardable and acceptable to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you cannot just have a good intention for it to be accepted and rewarded. It also has to be on the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And lying against him is certainly against uh, the sunnah, as he said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in a hadith in Bukhari, which means do not tell a lie against me for whoever tells a lie against me deliberately, then he will surely enter the hellfire, right? So there's no room for lying against Allah or his uh, messenger, right? Um, now, we already mentioned the lie that was being said about Allah in the previous verse when uh, they said Allah hasn't revealed anything. There's no such thing as revelation, basically. That's what they were saying, right? Um, and also this includes uh other false prophets who even in the lifetime of the Prophet وسلم, started lying and saying that I received revelation or I am a prophet, right? So all those people who claimed prophethood and were not prophets, obviously, like Musaylim al kadhab And, you know, Musaylim, by the way, used to claim that Jibreel alayhi salam comes to me, right? Um, there's another one by the name of Aswad al Ansi or, or Aswad al Gab. He said that, um, he, Ibn Kathir mentioned this, that uh, he used to claim that two angels speak to me. Their names are Sahih and Shariq, right? Uh, and there were all these other false prophets, right? So um, there was one individual who said that I'm, well, this is what the verse mentioned, right? That, uh, you know, who is more um, volume than the one who says that I will reveal the likes of which Allah has revealed. You can see that right here uh, in this verse, right? Woman of woman man Allahi and who is more um oppressive than the one who contrives a lie against Allah or says that it has been revealed to me and nothing in fact has been revealed to that person. They are not a prophet. Um, and the one who says that I shall reveal um, the likes of which Allah has revealed. So this is next level a type of kufr, subhanAllah. You know, there's, um, the, uh, the, the Sira bin Kathir mentions an individual by the name of Abdullah bin Sa'ad who used to say that if Muhammad reveals, receives revelation, so do I. And if Allah reveals, then I too reveal like Allah reveals. And so there are actually people making these kinds of claims that are directly referenced in this uh, verse. Um, so that was, this is the first reason of them receiving um, this punishment upon their death, the fact that they lied against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The second one is the sin of arrogance, which is what the verse ends with, right? وَقُنْتُمْ أَنْ آيَاتِهِ تَسْتَكْبِرُونَ So in the conversation um, that they will have uh, at the time of death, وَلَوْ تَرَى إِذِ الْغَلِمُونَ فِي غُمَرَاتِ الْمَوْتِ When you see that they are going to be in the you know pangs of death, and the angels are going to be, you know, extending out their hands uh, to them, you know, for their souls to come out. This is the reason that is given for them um, being receiving this punishment is the lies that they used to tell against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you were and you used to um, you know uh, show arrogance. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hates arrogance. The sin of arrogance is one of the greatest sins out there, right? Takabur on Kibir, right? The Prophet, um, there's a hadith on the Torah of Abdullah bin Mas'ud, a radiallahu uh, anhu hadith from Sahih Muslim, that the Rasul said, He who has in his heart an ant's, ant's weight, an ant, how tiny is an ant? He who has in his heart an ant's weight of arrogance will not enter Jannah. SubhanAllah. Someone said, a man likes to wear beautiful clothes and shoes. Uh, Rasulullah said, Allah is beautiful. He loves beauty. Arrogance means ridiculing and rejecting the truth and despising people. SubhanAllah. Look at that definition of arrogance, that accurate, specific definition of arrogance. Arrogance includes making fun of other people, looking down on other people, rejecting the truth, just being stubborn. You just don't want to listen. You feel like it's okay to make fun of others. It's okay to look down on others. You know, um, very easy for such a person to become hateful. You know, so an arrogant person will soon 
be a hateful uh, person, right? So these are things that this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told other places in the Quran to, to not make fun of others. And what is the reason given? Those people that you're making fun of may be better than you, right? So uh, we need to stay as far away from any, you know, a portion, even I mean, any small part, any aspect of arrogance we may have. And, you know, sometimes we don't think making fun of others is uh, arrogance, but in fact it is because you feel that they can be an object of your mockery and your jest and you're making fun. So you're not considering them your equals because your equals you would respect and your elders would you know look up to. Um, but when you make fun of someone, you ridicule uh, someone, you look down on someone for whatever reason, then this comes under arrogance. And this is something that uh, has such a horrible punishment, right? This person will not enter Jannah. And this is like such an authentic uh, hadith, the Sahih of Imam. Muslim. Okay, let's go to verse number 94. Verse number 94, by those who don't know. Okay, this is verse number 94, which means. And Allah will say, now you have come to us all alone, even as we had created you in the first instance. And you have left behind all that we had bestowed upon you in the world. We do not see with you your intercessors, whom you imagined to have a share with Allah in your affairs. You have now been cut off from one another and all those whom you imagined to be Allah's associates in your affairs have vanished from you subhanallah you know, this is such a scary verse because this is this person here standing you know all alone before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they have no helper with them all those people they used to associate uh, you know with uh, and Allah, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that they thought would be there for them on the day of judgment have vanished and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is addressing them that you have come here today before us all alone and you have left everyone and everything behind you including all of your blessings Subhanallah, Allah blesses even the kafir, right? Of course. Uh, otherwise, they would, <laughs> how would they remain alive and, you know, have food and drink and all the blessings of the world that they enjoy? And Subhanallah, once our uh, beloved Shaykh Shahakram, he said, Allah, that we do not deserve any of the blessings that we have. Mm -hmm. So we should never think that we're receiving these blessings because we deserve those blessings. No, we don't deserve the blessings that we have. We should never feel entitled to the blessings just because we have them today. It is in no way a reflection of our righteousness or of ourselves being worthy, right? It is only out of Allah's mercy that he continues to give to even the most ungrateful people who never even believe in him, right? So don't think I'm receiving these blessings because, because I'm good or grateful because even those that are the most ungrateful who commit shirk, even Allah subhanahu wa blesses even them, right? Everything that we enjoy in this life, everything that we have in this world, our homes, our parents, our families, our, you know, our entertainment, our vacations, our, you know, um, everything that we enjoy and love in this uh, world, never ever think that we deserve this peace and security where we are able to pursue these various forms of, you know, um, you know th things that we are involved in. We do not deserve it. It is the beneficence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he gives them to us in spite of us being undeserving, subhanAllah. So what is our job? Our job is to use those blessings in his obedience so that they can translate into eternal blessings, right? If you want to lose your blessings, be ungrateful. Act like a spoiled brat who is ungrateful and feels entitled and that they deserve this quickest way to lose your blessings our job is to use these blessings that Allah has given us in his obedience so they can translate into eternal uh, blessing we don't want to have these blessings temporarily in this world and then leave them behind in this world and they prove of no use to us in the akhirah because we didn't use them in his obedience and this is what is happening in this verse right here this person who is standing before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he's being told that you left everything behind. Everything has been left behind. 
that includes every person and every blessing and everything you committed shirk uh, with, you know. So those who had lied against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala remained arrogant. They will come before him empty-handed, having left everything they ever knew behind them, right? So here's this person standing in this stage, uh, state, state. And tragically, you know, all their partners that they, the, you know, that they associate with Allah are nowhere to be found. They cannot help them. They cannot assist them in any way whatsoever. The person is standing there completely empty-handed. Um, any benefit or security they thought that would come from these uh, idols or you know associates is uh, not coming forth. It has absolutely no reality. These are the ones that have lost their souls, have lost their families, have lost their blessings. Why? Because they did not use their intellect. You know, one of the reasons we lose our blessings is simply because we don't use our minds. Right? Losing uh, blessings because of not using uh, you know the mind, and we see this. Um, Actually, this verse in Surah Al-Mulk, verse number 10, If we had only listened and used our minds, we would not have been among the people of the fire, right? Obedience requires listening. Obedience requires using your mind, right? If we never listen, if we never use our minds, if we, you know, continue to act immaturely, act as if we don't know after we know, act like we don't know after we have received the knowledge, after we know how we're supposed to behave, still we act like we don't know how to behave. Um, this is not using one's uh, intellect, which is critical in order to make it safely out of this world into, um, uh, in and out of safety from the fire of hell. And this is something you read every night in Surah al verse number 10. Only we had listened and used our minds, we would not have been among the people of the fire. So if there's anything that we get out of today's lecture, it is let's use our minds. Let's use, let's listen to those who know better, to our parents, to our elders, to our, you know, to whoever it is that we are getting guidance from. Um, you know, and we're all in the same process. We all are in need of benefiting from our elders and uh, you know, scholars, et cetera. And we here are by no means uh, scholars. We're simply trying to reflect on the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and derive these gems so that we may be saved from uh, the fire of hell by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy. Um, okay, and let's look at probably the last verse for today, verse number 95. <laughs> let's look at verse number 95. In Allah <laughs> Truly, it is Allah who causes the grain and the fruit kernel to sprout. He brings forth the living from the dead and brings forth the dead from the living, such as Allah. So where are you tending in error, subhanAllah? You know, where are you going off to? It is Allah who causes the grain and the fruit kernel to sprout, who causes the gray seed grain to split open under the surface uh, of the earth. And he, he's the one who makes it grow and uh, you know, it becomes, uh, shows up as a plant on the surface of the earth. Who else other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, has done this? You know? And the word that's mentioned here in this verse, number 95, in Allah, al is a grain or a seed. One nawa, nawa is the date stone or the fruit pit, right? This is subhanAllah, such a beautiful verse on the great wonders of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his creation. How merciful it is uh, he is to his creation, how he provides for his creation. Remember Surah Al-An'am is an introduction to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and all that he does in the universe, including what he does for us, how he feeds us, right? He causes the date stone, the grain, the seed, the fruit pit to split open. Uh, right under the ground and he causes you know all this um, uh, you know food to all these crops to burst forth he brings forth uh, the living from lifeless matter he created us from lifeless dirt right um, he brings forth the uh, life uh, from dead like the chick comes forth from an uh, eggshell right so the eggshell is lifeless and here uh, comes forth a live chick we were created from dirt, something that is lifeless. And here we are, you know, a, a, a full of life human being. And he brings forth lifeless matter from the living, right? Like the egg comes from the chicken, right? Something lifeless, which is the egg coming from the chicken. All 
uh, lifeless matter coming forth, uh, subhanAllah, you know, by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the living and vice versa. And when it comes to the seed, he splits open, he causes it to grow. Imagine if he did not give the command to the seed to split open and grow and turn into crops and food for us, where would we get our food? Where would our supply come from if he did not command that seed to split underground and turn into a plant and turn into uh, crops that turn into our food, right? SubhanAllah, if he didn't make um, those, you know, uh, who would, could feed us, right? And it's not just one type of food, not one type of crop, SubhanAllah, you know, how many different types of food and crops and plants and fruit trees, et cetera, are there in different parts and different regions of the world and subhanAllah this tells us the sheer number and types of crops and fruits tell us that he is not just a lord who has provided this is a lord who is al-wudud who is an extremely loving lord and he is the most merciful and he is the most loving right subhanAllah because one type of food would have been enough, right? Um, you know, you don't need the Allah knows how many, I don't even know how many different types of crops are out there, how many different food types are out there in the world, right? Did we really need this many to sustain ourselves? No, but it is an expression of how Allah subhanahu wa is al-wudud. He is so loving. What a loving Lord he is. He is, he is so lovingly, so abundantly provided for us not one but countless varieties of foods and fruits to nurture us and everything you can think of other um, than human beings animals birds insects who are provided for uh, subhanallah in you know uh, different ways in different seasons all the time subhanallah um, you have fruits of different seasons but the uh, provision is going on all the time you know could any idol cause that seed to split underground does the idol or anything that is associated with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have the power to make that grain or that seed split and feed the entire population of humanity subhanAllah that tiny seed underground that he causes to split is sufficient evidence of tawheed of Allah's oneness because no one else has the power to make that seed split other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then how can anyone else be worshipped other than him when he is the one sustaining the universe, feeding the largest, you know, mammal, uh, which I think is a blue whale, right? To the smallest, uh, tiniest ant that you can't even see, right? He is providing rizq from the beginning, subhanAllah, you know, from the beginning of time, um, since he created the heavens and the earth until the end of time, he is continuously sustaining uh, the creation, subhanAllah. Uh, and his treasures do not run out, his stores do not uh, run out, you know. He seeds and feeds all of us. And um, then the verse asks them, where are you going? Where are you going? How are you then rejecting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? Um, how are you then going to go and associate others with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who do not possess any risk? They do not possess your life, nor your death, nor your resurrection. How is it that you can possibly uh, go to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? That would be uh, a question we would ask the mushrikeen and we would ask ourselves is how could you forget about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? The one whose food you know, the food, you know, the food is from him, the risk, the provision that we eat every day comes from him. How can we neglect him and forget him when we never forget to eat, right? If, if we never forget to eat, then how can we forget to thank the one who gives us to eat, right? SubhanAllah. So these days of the hijjah are days of remembrance, are days of shukr of days of uh, gratitude, are days of takbir, of declaring the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of affirming his tawheed, right? One of the best sirahs or forms of takbir is 
الله اكبر الله اكبر لا اله الا الله الله اكبر الله اكبر ولله الحمد right this one of the best forms of takbir the takbir that we all know and um, you know uh, say these on eid and we'll start on the day of arafah doing them after the congregational salahs right so what is that takbir saying what, are, what is it saying Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar, Allah is the greatest. He is the greatest. There is no other God but He. An affirmation of His Tawheed. And then Hamd praises for Him in His oneness and only for Him. And He is the greatest, right? And no one else is like Him. So, uh, you know, we can see Surah Al An'am um, completely in uh, sync with this, uh, you know, with these days of uh, remembrance of Allah uh, subhanahu wa ta'ala, recognizing Him, His oneness and his blessing them and being grateful for those. May Allah subhanahu wa make us among the qaleel, make us among the minority that is grateful, truly grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for all of his uh, blessings. So inshallah, with that, have a wonderful uh, rest of your week. Uh, inshallah, I'll try to post the assignment right now onto Google Classroom. Jazakallah khair for all of you that have been actually submitting the assignments. For those that have not, I encourage you to do so now uh, it is not too late and there'll be inshallah an extra good deed uh, in these days of the hijjah and inshallah we'll see you next Wednesday and now we are actually about to wrap up or you know um, only about a month less than a month left till we finish the uh, tafsir inshallah for surah al-anam so I hope inshallah you will all stay the course subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika la ilaha illa ant nastaghfiruka wa natubu alaykum assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh